All right, here we are again. This time we're going to be looking at my 1976 Chevrolet Malibu. Um, this car was bought, forgive me if I'm moving too fast, but uh, this car was bought for $1,000 from a guy I know. It had been sitting for about seven years. And uh, the title wasn't messed up by any means, but it had been signed and notarized seven years before I bought it. And in Kansas, they always charge you 10% whatever the fee is you know whatever your purchase price is and so because of that it ended up they had already put down a price and then it had been tagged because then they were charging a bunch of um, a bunch of fees and penalties on it so i picked it up you know for a thousand bucks it was still five they cut some of the fees off because i'm in there all the time buying cars and whatnot so they cut the fees out for me some it's still 560 some dollars to tag it a couple years ago but uh, anyway um the wheels that are on this and tires were actually on the 77 and um, originally and no, the tires weren't but you know the wheels were and I put these were on the black one was actually on mine and uh, anyway uh, I started doing body work on here a while back before I got a bunch of other projects going that's why it's partially primed and the reason I started doing body work is look at that mud look how thick that is I've never seen anything like that and this quarter was replaced uh, that has no rust on this side I can actually see you know you can probably see the line you can see where the weld line was for that new quarter. I've reached inside there, and it is a new quarter. It was not a vinyl roof car, so you didn't have to worry like that one was, where it's got a lot of problems up on the roof, and I'll show you that later on when we get started on it. But uh, anyway, I took everything clear down to the steel that I did do because of where all the mud was, it cracked. And once it cracks, it gets moisture under it. It just starts falling off even faster and rusts everything. Now, this thing went in a ditch, uh, and you can see... This is, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have to get a quarter. Look how thick that mud is. I just can't get over people doing that. This actually does have a patch uh, in it, but it's it's garbage. You can see it from inside the trunk. I'm not gonna bother you with that. But anyway, uh, so it's gonna need pretty much taken clear down the steel. And this fender will need replaced because when it went in the ditch, you can see it bent that up. Now, whether it has frame damage or not, I really can't tell. I may take it down and stick it on a rack, but I'm gonna change the springs first because it does sit a little funny on the one side. I've had to put spring space because it sat real, real low in the back. And I put two and a half inch exhaust on it and it rubs on everything. So I had to raise the car up in the back some to get it to stop. Anyway, so with the motor that was in, it was a 352 barrel originally. Uh, the, the guy I got it from, it was actually his boy's friend. They had to tore the 350 out, done a bunch of work on it that they thought was cool. They put a big cam in it and a big carburetor and intake and headers and just ran it. Now they were basically open header. And they thought they had themselves a real hot rod, but what they didn't understand was, uh, yeah, they rebuilt the stuff, um, but they used dish pistons and they used the old 76 heads. Now anybody who knows anything about the heads on these, when the emissions came out, 73, 74, uh, they went with a, especially if it was a two barrel, they had a really tiny valve, the ports were, gar I mean, they, they they wouldn't flow. A 305, 78 newer head would be better. N I'm not kidding, than, than that. But with the, the cam they put in and the compression, it, the thing was, uh, wow. All it did was make your ears bleed because it was so loud. It wasn't fast at all. And so I'd been wanting to do a swap, um, an LS style of swap, and so... I found an, an 03 Tahoe that had a bad transmission and a title messed up on it. And I brought it home and pulled it out and, uh, so, uh, and then did, you know, started the swap. Now, I did a lot of videos on this in the past and, and uh, I lost them. So I didn't get a chance to, 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 put it, to post them and it kind of aggravated me. It was on an iPad and it just had some issues and I lost all my videos. So I won't remember everything. If you have a specific question about the swap, uh, I will try to answer the best I can. Yes, this is an ugly swap. I did it on a budget. I did it where I could access everything I needed. And so there's nothing fancy or special about this swap. The motor has over 300,000 miles on it. It does not make funny sounds. It does not smoke. It does not rattle. Whoever had the Tahoe prior to the transmission going bad took care of it. Um, I pulled the oil pan, of course, because I put a, a Holley. I think it was a 302 dash two oil pan don't quote me on that but it was a newer version of the of the holly pan i wanted to make sure it cleared everywhere uh, i used all the truck accessories and um, i used lsx innovations i believe uh the adapt you know the plates to just to uh for, for the motor mount motor plates um 
I set it back to the factory turbo 350 location because that's I left the transmission in it. Because I put a shift kit in it and whatnot, and everything worked good on that. Uh, it's tight. The motor had to be set so far back. I can't get the wires shoved back here because you've got factory wires I didn't want to cut out, and you've got the truck wires here. You know, and it's 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 tight. I'm not gonna lie. It's I got plenty of room up front. Um, that's still got the factory truck fan in it. I just used a really big radiator, uh, aftermarket job, and. Um, Yes, I had to use an adapter uh, to get that hooked up. But I've been driving this thing over a year and haven't had any trouble. Um, for those of you wondering, I used the stock truck. Um, hang on a minute. i got to get the cat out of here. It's not my cat. Get out, meathead. Uh, sorry. Um, he's not helping anything. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, uh, I put, of course, uh, uh, when I had the motor out, besides the, the holly oil pan, I put a new fuel, I got it, I put a new water pump, new thermostat. Uh, it's got headers that I would love to get into right now, but I'm not going to. Uh, two and a half inch heart throb exhaust all the way out the back with turbo mufflers. Um, the power steering, what I was getting at before the cat interrupted, if you notice, that is a brass fitting along with, sorry about that, that's fuel return, and that is fuel supply, and those are brass fittings. Uh, when a guy told me to do that, a friend of mine, who did an outlet swap is one I got the 68 Chevelle wagon from. He's the one who said use those. I I kind of laughed. I thought, man, there's no way this is going to work. But the, the tubing, the original tubing from the, most of the LS stuff is either a, a, an aluminum or some type of a soft stainless. And it, uh, man, I, I tried everything and could, could not get it to, to seal. These brass things were great. Uh, I've had, like I said, I've been driving it over a year and nothing has leaked. Not even one drop since I've done it. So. Anybody who's doing those swaps who want to keep some of the factory stuff, um, specifically power steering and stuff like that, it's the way to do it. And uh, because it really makes a huge difference. Uh, I know this is a big car, and yes, you can see a big dent on top of that. And yes, the hood's cut out. The hood needs replaced anyway. Um, that was just how it had to happen. It fit under as much of the hood as I, you know, it could get. Uh, the, the engine cover I have, but obviously would not would not fit. So. Uh, as you do notice, for those of you who know anything about these A bodies, usually your battery's sitting there. Well, I, because I used the truck uh, wiring harness, the battery ended up being relocated over here, which worked out fine. Because uh, I think only it was over there is that charcoal canister, which had to go anyway. Yes, the computer's mounted straight to steel, and I know a lot of people told me you can't do that. They're in plastic boxes uh, for a reason. I have overgrounded this car. Um, I even left, for those of you wondering, yes, I've even got the one that goes to the hood still hooked up. I I am a firm believer in grounding. Um, ever since the problem with that BMW that I had the video on the other day, the blue one, uh, where it caught on fire a couple of times, I ran extra ground wires even to the fuel pump after it burned that first one out. I didn't mention it in that first video, but uh, this thing is, is very well grounded. Yeah, if it ever loses a computer, I have another one laying around, just have to have it reflashed I mean it's uh, yeah it's, it could catch the car on fire I suppose but uh, I don't think there's enough power going in there to do that <laughs> who knows um, this is something I got off of eBay it's a multi pin um, obviously fuse box I didn't want to use the truck one all my pink wires and sensor wires go into that along with I think the tack maybe or something anyway uh, I did that just for the simple fact that uh, I could actually separate everything out and not have uh, a whole bunch of wires onto one, you know, one fuse or, you know, keep adding to it. Uh, it worked out fine. I've had no trouble with it. This is the drive-by-wire computer, and then that's the fuel pump relay and uh, whatnot. I know they said you want to put it back there by the pump, but it, I ran a big heavy wires back there and stuff, but I didn't want that stuff being exposed to some of you know, the weather. Um, the fuel pump is a Wilbro 255 uh, frame mount. I've had no trouble with that. The tank had garbage in it. I put a big filter, uh, 10 micron, in front of the pump. I've had to replace it twice. It's finally got to where it's cleaned all the garbage out of the tank and seems to be better. Um, I can't think of a whole lot else. Uh, for those who are running or want to run an aftermarket gauge, uh, that can be a problem with the LS motors because there's not a lot of places to hook stuff up. I will try to show you right there, almost the center, try to get my finger down there. This here is actually drilled and tapped into the water pump. That is my temperature center for the mechanical gauge. 
and um, it's in front of the thermostat. Now understand that this is uh, these are reverse flow. I don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, so that means it pulls from the top and discharges through the bottom. So being on the other side of that uh, thermostat, you're going to get all your main heat. That's where it's going to read before it opens that thermostat. Uh, that may not be the ideal location. I know a lot of people say the head's the best place, and I understand that. But I didn't want to drill holes in that. And I, once I had the motor in and realized I couldn't add anything to it, it was, it was no, I wasn't going to pull it back out just to drill that one, you know, that one place out in the head on the back side, especially because I barely have any room because of that air conditioner anyway. The mechanical oil pressure gauge, the one that Holly aftermarket uh, pan, still, of course, had the, the place set up for the oil cooler that the six liters have and understand the four eight five three and six liter uses all especially these years this is an 03 anything from 99 up that uses the ls style motor um they use the same oil pan the six liter uses an external uh, uh oil cooler so there's a all the pans have the exact same deal they just stick a bypass uh, cover over it and i said bypass for a reason do not plate that off. If you guys end up with a six liter and you want to use a truck pan for some reason, and you see that those two holes up there and there's nothing there to cover because they've taken the you know the hoses off, don't plate that off. That will cause lots of problems. One is it'll bypass your oil filter for sure. I don't know what other problems it'll have, but you need to put a bypass on there or, or, or find a 4A or 5.3 out in the junkyard that's got an oil pan or people selling oil pans that's still got those, those bypasses on it. Well, anyway, the new pan, Holly actually had one of those in it so what I did was I drilled and tapped the center of that out and then put a, a copper tube up to the gauges and the tack it actually is there's a place in the computer to, to hook it up so uh, just ran the wires you normally would just ran the you know the sensor there or the, the pickup or whatever you want to call it on there so uh, anyway um, the thing runs and drives pretty good I've been having a lot of problems with the drive-by wire uh, throttle body and I'll get into that in a minute uh, if you want to uh, know something like I said specific about what I did or didn't do on this uh, I mean just as a quick rundown on some of the problems I've, I've run into I could go into it more but that just bore the crap out of you so I'm not going to do it uh, the car is obviously going to need a lot of body work we've already somewhat discussed this uh, inside I guess the buzzer still hooked up I'll pull the key as soon as I get it open that's not the factory start steering wheel and it's not the factory seats that's uh it had a bent seat in it and had the, the standard uh 15 inch steering wheel and i could not get in out of the car it does not have tilt and um, when i went to get it, i just could not get in out of the car so uh the first thing i did was i bought a, a cheap 13 inch steering wheel without a center cap i got it really cheap because it was missing a part and um, then the seats in the console were actually an old one top uh, excuse me uh, s10 blazer that was uh junk i paid like 250 or 300 bucks for the whole thing four-wheel drive uh, it had been wrecked at one time and kind of crappily fixed it was hemorrhaging water out of one of the soft plugs and then it, one of the transmission transfer case weren't doing any good uh, but anyway a friend of mine was one the rest of it so I just took the seats out and I put them in yes they're electric I hooked all that stuff up and they work yes that's my OBD2 testers hooked up to get down here I know the Sun is probably messing with you guys that's my OBD2 Unplug it, no big deal. Get that out of the way. Uh, so there's my OBD2. Uh, you know, reread it. Uh, that's the check engine light off to the left of the gauges there. It's just a piece of aluminum bent over with an LED light, and then, of course, my gauges. And uh, what I'm running into problem wise is sorry about that, I'm moving my hand around. Um, it started out as driving down the road. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, went to go start it one day and the check engine light came on the thing was idling really fast and I didn't have any foot control at all um, so I thought well that's that's an odd deal so I brought I got my code reader luckily it happened here in the driveway and I put it on there and it showed both the foot the drive by wire foot pedal and the and your uh, throttle body was bad I cleared the codes thing fired right up and didn't have any trouble with it a few days later it did it again now mind you I've, I've been left on the side of the road a couple of times. I try not to ever have that happen. So if I see a problem, I either fix it immediately or I try to bring something with me to fix it. In this case, I kept my OBD2 reader with me. And uh, otherwise, a 5 16 wrench may or may not do it by unhooking the battery, which I try to keep a 5 16 or 8 millimeter wrench in all my top post battery, side post battery GM stuff because of uh, something else I'll get into later on. But anyway, so I... Uh, 
that was a problem and it left me sitting at work once I end up having to do it and then it started doing it more frequently and then it started doing it every time I went to start it it would do this and uh, I thought man I'm gonna have to fix this well the day that I just let it go it then started doing it driving down the road and you'd be driving and just boom the check engine light would come on and thing would rev up now luckily it'll actually go 30 mile an hour but you don't have any other control. If you're up a hill or stopped at a stoplight, it will take off, but it does do a very good job, and you have no, nothing, no controls at all. So, uh, uh, anyway, long story short, uh, we were messing with a, a friend of mine. Was, I was showing him what it was doing at work, and he reached down there and grabbed the harness to that uh, throttle body, and it made a bunch of clicking sounds. So I've either got a bad, uh, I cleaned the connection, uh, with the, you know sandpaper and everything and uh, you know emery paper and cleaned everything up the best I could and stuck it back in it seemed to help and then immediately went right back to it so I don't know if the harness is bad or if the drive by wire or the, the excuse me the throttle body is bad now I have another throttle body so that's not a big deal uh, I'm cleaning it up right now and uh, I'm going to put it on I'll do a video of that possibly uh, anyway so I don't know if it'll do it or now or not let me start this thing up forgive the sound see the check engine lights on like it's supposed to Yep, it's stuck on. Now, I didn't do it a minute ago when I started it. Just to show you what it's doing, it's revving up high. It's running about 1,600, getting closer to 17. Look at this foot pedal, though. I have nothing. But that's no good. Shut this thing back off. Plug this back in. Sorry about that. Ah. Well, anyway, now I've got an old older reader here, but uh, well, I'll show you what it's doing. I got uh, four. It's a TPS throttle position sensor A, mount, circuit malfunction. Uh, TPS throttle position sensor AB, voltage correlation. I don't know what all that means. Then it says the pedal. And... Uh, so you got pedal, and then you've got well, showing pedal on all of them. But either way, if I erase them, I heard it click up front, and then check engine lights off. As soon as it does its little thing, it'll idle back down. Now mind you, it's still cold. I haven't had that running very long. I think I got a set idle set at like 750 warm, and then I've got my foot pedal back. So, obviously we have a problem. I'm going to have to fix that. There's no way around that. So I'll probably do a video of that and uh, get that replaced. And, and then uh, we'll take it down the road. And uh, it's running a bit fat, especially cold. As you can see, with all the mileage on it, it's holding about 34 pounds of pressure. It usually holds closer to 48 going down the highway. Uh, with the Turbo 350, um, you guys got to understand, I did this on a budget. The transmission, I wished I would have pulled, kept that transmission and not took, pinned out all the transmission wires and had it deleted out of the computer. Um, now I wish I'd taken that, that four-wheel drive transmission down, had it converted to two-wheel drive or traded in or whatever and had it rebuilt and just used the 4L60 that was in it. And Because uh, I ended up having to change the cross member anyway because of the dual exhaust. Those were, these cars were not designed to have dual exhaust. And it would have hung down, especially like I said, two and a half inch are already, you know, hang down pretty low. Um, so I wished I would have done a couple of things different, uh, especially with that transmission. Because here's the problem. This is a turbo 350 with a 287 rear gear with a 275 6015 rear tire, which is about 27 and a half inches tall. Now they're burned out a little bit because like I said, it came off that other car. So you're probably talking, you know, 27 inches tall or so. And you're only talking 325 cubic inch out of the 5.3 in a car that weighs 4,500 pounds. So you're talking something, even with a turbo 350, will probably run 130, 40 mile an hour without any problem. The car would shake apart long before that. It would take a while to get there, but I think it would do it. The biggest problem is it's not really good for bottom end because the motor doesn't produce a tremendous amount of torque, and especially stock in this many miles. You also are, are, like I said, dealing with weight, wind, and the gear ratio. So with all that put together, without a stall converter, 
this thing's kind of a turd. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's, it's not really all that great out of the hole. It runs fine. And I can get well over 21, 22 mile a gallon on the highway uh, doing a little 60 mile run, like I said, on the Mustang that I do. That's some in town, some on a highway. It still does really well on gas. A uh, lot better than it would have stocked. But if you're looking for something to drag race or have fun with, it's going to burn tires from every stoplight, this is not the way to go. Not without the either gear or a, a stall converter or something, and or something that's got a different you know, different amount of miles on it, or even a bigger, a six liter, uh, is quite a bit more torque, and uh, they just feel so much better. Now the reason I got the camera trained on the mileage deal here is now here's something else you run into on your swap if you're running a anything that has a mechanical speedometer on it. The computer has to know if the car is moving or not. Now on your stock transmissions on the LS, it's fine. It's all digital. It knows what it's doing. And I was told that I was going to need a pulse generator. And they give me the Dakota part number. And this is a little plug for LT1Swap.com. He's the one I went to uh, to uh, figure out all the pinouts because I pinned out all the, the wiring harness myself. And I asked him couple of questions i sent him my computer originally i ended up having to have it redone here with a guy local because of some other issues i was having but um he did a really good job i can't remember his name off the top of my head but he did a real good job and boy his his and the information on his site is worth the time if you're doing the swap especially if you're doing your own pin out anyway he was the one who told me i had to have this uh this pulse generator and give me the part number and he showed me where to told me where to hook it up and everything, so it was no big deal. Well, I've had other people on other forums say that you don't need that. Uh, I'm telling you, you do, and I found that out the hard way. I got the car running, I drove it three miles down the road, and boom, the speedometer quit. And I thought, what what happened? So I come down to a stop, the car dies, and it does this every time I stop. It, it dies. It's running really crappy, and I thought, what is going on? So I pulled it back up in the garage, jacked it up, and it had stripped the plastic gear out of the transmission. So I had another Turbo 350 laying here. I pulled it, the little gear out, put it back in, and now everything was working. And the car straightened right up. Didn't have any more trouble with it. So just FYI, unless somebody has a magic tune that can fix that, uh, I had to have it. So uh, at least on my application, you have to have a pulse generator on there. They're really not all that expensive through Dakota Digital. And uh, like I said, the aftermarket gauges... They're not in the ideal location, but they work great. And lights, of course, are hooked up. Everything, the wiring is not the best. There's still speaker wires hanging down from the stereo that used to be in it. I need to go through all this and clean this car up. But uh, the reason I didn't put the cover back on, or I think it was just had carpet or something, I don't remember now, uh, where you see that hole, is that I have a S10 five-speed. And those move the shifters up. And I'm, I'll have to move my tack. But I'm putting a five-speed. And I have some of the parts together. I've got a bell housing. I've got a transmission. I've got a uh, flywheel, so I'm, I'm starting to get all the parts together to do a five-speed swap on this. And a shifter location will likely come out really close to that hole. I can move this console back and forth either direction some. I modified it to fit in the car, and it was actually a pretty good fit, considering, I mean, the carpet, of course, is the wrong color. But, uh, I mean, there's a little gap here and there, I'm, you know, but it actually fit the rest of it. It was, it was pretty decent, and it's nice to have cup holders in an old car, so... Um, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's uh, it's pretty good. So anyway, I'm going to get off here now, and uh, hopefully on some of the next videos, I'll actually show you swapping that out because, like I said, it's either the it's either the harness or it's the actual throttle body. So I will swap it out with the one I have and see if that doesn't fix it. And uh, I may do a how-to on that. It's not that big of a deal. You just you know, mind you, your coolant goes through there, so you have to plug that off. But it shouldn't take that long to change that. And uh, so I may do a quick video on actually doing that, and then I'll uh, I'll try to get it set up a little bit better in my last attempts that I ended up not being able to put on because they were so so crappy. So anyway, guys, I'm gonna get off here and uh, talk to you later.